not as fiction, but as fact. So often we think that we are alone in the challenges that we are confronted with. But if we are living for God Almighty, He is present no matter what is happening in our lives. And if the result brings honor and glory to his name, it is his battle, not ours. Some years ago, working for the United Nations, I encountered a situation with two of my bosses. I went to the Lord in prayer, and his word came back to me with outstanding results. This is the word that my Heavenly Father gave me. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Let me say to you with a humble heart, the outcome was wonderful, satisfying, enjoyable, and victorious. The subject of my message today is the triumph of faith. Our text will be Psalm 16, verse 8. There are three main points I want to share with you. One, following Yeshua, Jesus to Christ, by faith. Then companionship with Yeshua, Jesus to Christ. And then having unshakable faith in Yeshua, Jesus to Christ. David of the shepherd boy, soldier and king, in the affirmation of his faith, would say with confidence, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. I shall not be moved. So here we have following Jesus Christ by faith. What is faith? The Living Bible renders this way. It is the confident assurance that something you want is going to happen. It is the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us. Even though we cannot see it up ahead. Hebrews 11, 1. Living by faith means facing life situations with great hope of success. And all that we are doing, our enemy is always trying to create disappointment and doubt. The challenges for us is to take the Apostle Paul's assuring statement and embrace it with confidence. Here's what he had to say. Romans 8, 36 to 39. He says, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels or principalities nor powers, nor things present or things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. How about Moses, the man of God, who followed the God of the Old Testament, who became Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, the Savior of mankind in the New Testament. Hebrews 11, verses 23 to 29. It said, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because he saw he was a beautiful child. And they were afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, 
choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God that they enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. There is a solid reason to embrace the comforting statement from Paul in Psalm Romans 8.37. It is because we have a counterbalance. Having a counterbalance. I have set the Lord always before me. What is the difference or definition of a counterbalance? The reader's Oxford Dictionary gives me this. Influence acting in opposition. We have set. Meaning, we have made the determination to set the Lord always before us. This is the decision we made when we said yes to the invitation. The invitation came from God the Father. Remember the words of our Master and Lord, speaking to his disciples on the subject, I am the bread of life. The Jewish establishment had their own negative opinion about Jesus. John 6, 41 to 44. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. There will always be a negative attitude among some people in the community where you came from. They will never think highly of you. And this is what happened to our elder brother, Jesus Christ. Here is a precise situation that Yeshua encountered. We find the story in Mark Gospel with the title, Jesus is Rejected at Nazareth. Mark 6. Verses 1, 2, and 4, and 5. Then he came out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get? these things and what wisdom is this which he has been given that such words were performed by his hands so they were offended at him and Jesus said to them a prophet is not without honor except in his own country among his own relatives and his own house and he could do no much miracles there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. We know that we cannot walk this journey alone because the circumstances of engagement are not just physical, 
they are also spiritual. Paul speaking to the Ephesian church on the subject, put on the whole arm of God, said this, Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 13. He said, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take up the whole arm of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, we also have a great assurance that Jesus Christ, our Master, is our counterbalance in our determination to achieve victory over sin. Speaking to the church at Rome on the subject, believers' death to sin in principle, Paul gives this encouraging statement, Romans 6. Verses 20 to 23. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things thereof, which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, and becoming servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end or the goal is everlasting life now here comes the counterbalance for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord but then we have this our indefinite dependence meaning always I have set the Lord always before me. Psalm 16, 8. The word always does not mean sometimes. It means consistency and intelligently. This is the fight plan, and if we stay with the plan, then we cannot lose the fight. These are not empty words. These are the words of the wise man Solomon who understood the successes of life and the disappointments of life, which he called vanity and vexation. Here he speaks about the benefits of wisdom. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 8. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. To continue with the benefit of wisdom, Solomon gave this wonderful instruction concerning your heart, meaning your intellect, your emotions and your mind. Proverbs 4 verses 23 to 27. He said, keep your heart before diligence. For out of it springs the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put, preserve, lips from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and let your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Remove your foot from evil. This journey, this fight, is what our life is all about. It is the little, it is the battle of the mind a race of endurance, and a journey of faith. Every day we get, uh, we are allowed to get up 
from a good night's sleep. To face another day, we must consistently remind ourselves of who we are and the reason for our existence. We have a desire for membership in the God family, the Almighty God, Jesus Christ, or passport. How are we going to achieve this goal? Following his leadership. In other words, he is ahead of us. I have set the Lord always before me. Yes, he is ahead of us. This is the advantage of knowing our master, the Savior, and having the courage and a firm belief in his leadership. When talking about leadership, they're the favorite song I love to sing. and I get all choked up whenever I sing it. It's one of our favorites. It says, wherever he leads, I'll go. He says, take up your cross and follow me. I heard the master say, I give my life to ransom thee. So I'll surrender you all today. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loved me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. This brings us comfort with all the confusion, the disappointments, the different bureaucratic establishment across planet Earth. Who is not fighting against each other? is fighting among themselves. These conflicts are intensifying every day. Because of these disturbing situations, we must continue to pray, thy kingdom come. That's the only way we're going to solve the problems. There's no way of turning back. There's no way out. It is the kingdom of God Almighty that will correct the unpleasant conditions that we see every day. What we are seeing is just what our elder brother Yeshua Jesus to Christ spoke about before he returned to heaven to be at the right hand of the rule of the universe. Matthew 24 verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus went out, departed from the temple, and the disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, Not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. We know from history that sometime after Jesus spoke those words, Jerusalem was invaded and the temple was destroyed. Quote, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Jewish war began in, 19, in, in 66 AD, sorry, and there was a direct revolt by the Jews against the Rome's authority. Titus, with his Roman legion, arrived at the outmost northern wall of Jerusalem. The Passover of 70 AD, the Romans built embankments of earthen work. They placed battering rams and the seas began. Though this was a historical fulfillment, they are the future fulfillment to come. End of quote. We are now looking ahead for what is to come. Matthew 24.3 now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, or Jesus is Lord. And will deceive many. You'll hear wars and rumors of wars. 
See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. In the midst of all this uncertainty, there is one thing we must continue to strive for. That brings me to my second point. Companionship with Jesus Christ through faith. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. The greatest inspiration in the Christian walk with God is to be in companionship with Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. King David understood that truth and he depended fully on that relationship. David speaking on the theme, the divine shepherd said this, Psalm 23, 1 to 6, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare me a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Then he said, Surely goodness and mercy shall fall me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is what we got to do. With all the misery going on, we must dwell in his house. When the Sabbath comes, this is important. When we get our quiet time, that companionship hold us together. Our master, our, our walk with the master is not based on deception. It is based on conviction, revelation, and a deep understanding of God Almighty's love for us. Let's understand this truth. When we talk about conviction, we are talking about the realization that a covenant relationship with Jesus to Christ also develops a companionship with him. The question is, are we rejoicing in his love? Are we meditating in his love? Are we living in his love as members of the church of Yeshua, Jesus to Christ? When victories over our enemies and success comes, when it comes away, what should be our reaction? The disciples walked with Jesus while he was here on earth, and he encountered a situation like that. And the master instructed them how they should behave. This is what he said. Luke 10, verses 16 to 20. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him that sent me. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. Mm -hmm. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall from heaven, fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, here comes the word of caution, and the reason for rejoicing. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. 
That's what we rejoice about. We are not fighting the air. We're not going empty. We're not uncertain to where we're going. The thing is, are we determined to keep going? Or are we going to become distracted and weak in the knees? This world of darkness does not comprehend the value of the favor of God Almighty that has been extended to those who are in companionship with Jesus Christ. When you contemplate the joy of salvation in Jesus Christ through the forgiveness of sins and the battle of the mind with the help of the Spirit of our Creator, the incentive is to maintain this great and wonderful companionship with Him. And it's greater than gold. It is something money cannot buy. There's a special love that the eternal shows toward those who have trusted him. Yeshua speaking to his disciples concerning his death and resurrection had this to say. John 16 verses 25 to 28. He said, these things I've spoken to you in figurative language. But the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. But I will talk plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me. And I believe that I came from God. I came forth from the Father. And I've come into the world. Again I leave the world and go to the Father. Here's another viewpoint that is connected to companionship. It is having an unshakable faith in Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. He says, uh, David said, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Question to you is, is your faith unshakable? Would you say that your faith in Jesus to Christ is unshakable? What makes you feel that your faith is unshakable? What gives you the assurance that your faith is unshakable? unshakable these are questions that I think we all should be asking ourselves in these changing times of conflict and uncertainty the world is being affected both domestically and internationally and we are seeing disturbing conditions that point us to the return of Jesus Christ our praise and supplications must be centered on our unshakable faith in our soon coming King. Jesus, our Lord and Master, had unshakable faith in God the Father, had he begun his ministry and throughout his life in his humanity as the Son of Man. We have read the Bible and we have seen all the things that he did with the help of God the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of John on the theme, Equality with God in Authority, stipulates the unshakable faith of Jesus Christ and God Almighty. Here's what the writer had to say. John 5 verses 26 to 30. For as the Father hath life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel like this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear the voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. 
and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now the Apostle Paul, a servant of God Almighty, developed unshakable faith in Christ Jesus. He was a man on a mission to destroy the church of Yeshua, but he was stopped by an intervention of the hand of the eternal. His life was turned around and he became a representative of Jesus Christ and devoted or develop an unshakable faith in him. His testimony is a declaration of his strong faith. Romans 1, verses 14 to 17. He said, I'm a dapper both to the Greek, to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So, as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you, both in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. We have looked at two outstanding characters in the New Testament, Jesus and the Apostle Paul. We start in the Old Scripture with David and Moses. I must conclude two other, or include two other outstanding men of great faith. Let's see what the Scripture have to say about Noah and Abraham. Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, no. After divinely being warned of God, things not yet seen, move with godly fear. Prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. And we have Genesis 6, verses 12 and 13. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. Corrupt then, corrupt now. I saw something yesterday, I was watching a favorite program of mine, and then they showed me things in the background. I want to slam the TV, but I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. Yes, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their ways on the earth. Is exactly the picture I saw watching something and I saw in the background. And I'm saying I look at Sodom and Gomorrah again, all over. And God said to know the end of all flesh had come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under the heaven all flesh in which there is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons and your wives, and your son wives with you. I was saying to my wife the other day, I was, I kind of give her a riddle. And I said, we know all the things that were put into the ark. But they never mentioned fish. <laughs> she said, fish, and I said, no, 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 no. I said, the fish were swimming in the water. They didn't need to go to the ark. <laughs> where are you going to put them in the ark? They were in the water swimming. Some might have died, of course. But they didn't need the ark. 
This is what I call unshakable faith in God Almighty. Noah had never seen a flood before, but he believed the creator of heaven and earth, and he obeyed the instructions that were given to him. With great faith and obedience, he built an ark saving himself and his family. We are developing our faith and companionship with Jesus Christ to be in the kingdom of God. It took hard work for Noah to build the ark. It will take hard work with the help of the spirit of our heavenly father to get in his family. You're not just going to walk in, say, Lord, I believe. It don't work that way. Can't work that way. A master went through a lot of stuff for us. He was beaten beyond recognition. Now we have an opportunity to be in the family. And I often say he is our passport to the family. But we got to follow in his footsteps to get there. We are his begotten sons and daughters, called, sanctified for service, and training to qualify for his government. Let's look at Patriarch Abraham and why he was called the father, the faithful. His unshakable faith was tested and it pleased the almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth and this universe. This was shortly after the birth of Isaac and after he was weaned, meaning able to eat food other than feeding on a mother's milk. We find the story in Genesis 21.8. Now in Genesis, now in chapter 22, we continue the story under the subject, Offering Isaac. Genesis 22, 1 to 9, 19. Reading from the Living Bible. Later on, God tested Abraham's faith and obedience. Abraham, God called. Yes, Lord, he replied. Take your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah and sacrifice him as a burnt offering upon a mountain which I shall point out to you. Next morning, Abraham got up early, chopped the wood for the fire upon the altar, saddled the donkey, and took with him his, his son Isaac and two young men who were his servants, and started off to the place where God had told him to go. On the third day of the journey, Abraham saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the young man. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and then come back. You talking about unshakable faith? Tell the young man, young lad, we're coming back. Mm -hmm. Abraham placed the wood on, for the burnt offering upon Isaac's shoulders. While he himself carried a knife and the flint for striking the fire. So the two of them went on together. Father, Isaac asked, we have the wood and the flint to make the fire. But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? God will see to it, my son. Abraham replied. And they went on. When they arrived at the place where God had told Abraham to go, he built an altar and placed the wood in order, ready for the fire, and then tied Isaac and laid him on the altar over the wood. Many of us contemplate and ask, how old was this kid? He had to be a kid because he was walking with something, but he wasn't an infant for sure. Abraham took the knife and lifted up the plunge into the sun to slay him. At that moment, an angel of God shouted to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes, Lord, he answered. Lay down the knife. Don't hurt the lad in any way, the angel said. 
For I know that God is first in your life. You have not withheld even your beloved son from me. And Abraham knows a ram caught in his horns in the bush. So he took the ram, sacrificed it instead of his son as a burnt offering on the altar. God our Father will always make a way out when we trust him. He was standing by to see what happened. He saw what Abraham was going to do, that his faith was there. But he already had a plan. The ram was in the bush. Don't touch the kid. Don't touch the kid. Abraham named the place Jehovah provides. And it still goes by that name to this day. Then the angel of God called again to Abraham from heaven. I, the Lord, have sworn by myself that because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your beloved son from me, I will bless you with incredible blessings and multiply your descendants into countless thousands and millions like the stars above you in the sky and like the sands along the shore. They will conquer their enemies and your offspring will be a blessing to all the nations on the earth, all because you have obeyed me. So they return to the young men and travel home again. The writers of Hebrew ask the question, what can we say about many other heroes of faith? Hebrews 13 Verses 30 to 40. Hebrews 11, sorry. Verses 32 to 40. And what shall we say? For the time would fail me to call or to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jethro. Also of David and Samson and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms work righteousness Obtain promises, stop the mouth of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the enemies of the aliens. Women retrieved their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted and tormented. Of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves and of the earth. And all these haven't obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provide something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Finally, brethren, the success of our journey is the triumph of faith. The ultimate goal is the family and the kingdom of God Almighty. The question is, do you still think the journey is worth it? Are you committed to the task? I will close with this example of Christ in Jordan. Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 4. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such great clouds of weaknesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your mind.